were his contributions to the instrument. When you think of the guitar, what do you picture? Are the images of your favorite guitar players conjured in your mind? Chuck Berry? The Beatles? Bob Dylan? Andreas Segovia? Jimi Hendrix? How about Metallica? The etymology for the word guitar is one that should be looked into. In Farsi or Persian language, the word for the number four is chaha and string is ta. Combined, it's chata or chatara. Certainly, there is a plethora of early instruments in the Iberian Peninsula and North Africa containing very similar names for various instruments, many with four strings. We will be more focused on the development of the guitar in Spain, as the most meaningful changes occurred there in the Iberian Peninsula. It was in Spain that the guitar had a slow evolution over the years to get to what is recognisable to us today, and where the instrument is innately intertwined with the culture. The guitar as we know today was largely developed in Spain, spanning over several periods. More specifically, we will be focused on the developments of one maker in particular, a renowned guitar maker named Antonio de Torres Jurado, who had a profound impact on the modern guitar as we know it. Although the guitar has also been developed by various makers in Europe and beyond, the instrument has become a symbol of Spanish culture. The Spanish poet and Nobel Vicente Alessandra remarked, the guitar is the soul of Spain. Flamenco guitar maestro Paco de Lucia said, the soul of Spain sings through every strum of the guitar. Federico Garcia Lorca mentions the guitar in several of his poems. Having a long, deep history, the guitar had many stages of evolution through many luthiers to arrive at the point where it is today. During the 16th century, the Portuguese craftsman Belchior Diaz working within the Spanish borders, set the stage for the guitar's intrinsic connection to the Iberian Peninsula. His innovations in shaping the vihuela, a precursor to the guitar, laid the foundation for an instrument that would become synonymous with the rich musical heritage of Spain. This instrument was made in 1590 and contained five double strings, which was the standard in that period. Thomas Duran of Seville, so far, is the only known luthier to have made a guitar in the Baroque period to include the maker's information, name, location and date of 1684. Francisco Sanguino of Seville seems to be an early pioneer of adding a sixth string to the instrument, as shown here on a 1770 guitar. Perhaps he was one of the first to standardise this configuration. The Guerra family should be considered in the study of guitars, for apart from making beautiful six-course guitars in 1798 in this example, they also were involved in the export business of these instruments to Spain's colonies such as Cuba in the New World. The Pagues dynasty, started by Juan Senior and later by his son, José, made some interesting developments in the guitar's evolution. They were a part of the Cadiz school of making. Juan Pagues had enlarged the body to a more modern size, also some experimentation with internal bracings resembling our modern bracing system today. Their guitars were favoured by the best guitarists in that period, such as Fernando Sor and Dionisio Aguado. José Pernas is of the Granada school of making. In the Granada fashion, the headstock is a carved scroll, narrow body and other features tying it to that local tradition. José Pernas is important in the scene because it is believed that he might have taught Torres. Interestingly, in 1860, a guitar by Pernas seems to have taken a page from Torres's book, showing many of the designs Torres would become famous for in an interesting exchange between the two masters. Antonio de Torres Jurado Antonio de Torres Jurado was born on June 13, 1817, in La Cañada de San Urbano, Almería, Spain. 
Torres was a true innovator, a pioneer in his craft. His work reshaped the very essence of the guitar. He is the maker who invented the modern Spanish guitar that we still use today. Having drawn from his predecessors before him, he played a critical role in the guitar's development, arguably even affecting the outcome of the modern-day steel string acoustic guitar and even the electric guitar. From his humble beginnings, his journey would lead him down a path of artistry and innovation, a path that would forever change the world of music. The town of Almeria, with its whitewashed buildings and winding cobbled streets, provided a vibrant backdrop for young Antonio's early years. As a young boy, he was surrounded by the sights and sounds of his Andalusian heritage, a place where music and art were woven into the fabric of daily life. This exposure ignited a spark in him, a fascination with the instrument's intricate details and the sound it could produce. Little did he know that this fascination would transform into a lifelong passion and a profound impact on the world of music. In the charming streets of his youth, a young boy's fascination with guitars began to shape his destiny. Torres's early life was modest, filled with the simple pleasures of Andalusian culture. His family, though not involved in guitar making, fostered an environment rich in the traditions of their region. The lively melodies of local musicians filled their home, and young Antonio was entranced by the music of his heritage. Though an ideal, picturesque setting for a luthier, his early adulthood was postmarked with a series of hardships. The year 1834, at 17, he was drafted into the army to fight in the Carlists' wars, but discharged due to health reasons. A year later, at 18 years old, he hastily wedded his first wife, Juana Maria Lopez, perhaps in a stint to avoid being drafted again due to the fact that single men and widowers without dependents were vulnerable for military duty. The following year saw the birth of his first child, a daughter, Maria Dolores. By this time, he is already a member of the Carpenters' Guild and suffers a humiliating experience when debt collectors confiscate from him some fine chairs, a table, and even his best quality saw due to inability to pay. Not long after this episode, his second daughter is born, but dies the very next year. Only three years after the passing of his second daughter, tragically, he also experiences the death of his wife to tuberculosis. She was just 23 years of age when she passed. These succession of traumatic experiences became the motivation for Torres to relocate, for at the time of his wife's death, he resided in the provincial town of Vera due to perhaps a temporary investment venture, which he did see profit from in the silver mining business. Apart from the recent tragedies that befallen him, Vera is a town with limited resources and opportunities, as his business there also seemed to dry up. Shortly after his wife's death, he relocated to Seville. Seville is the capital of Andalusia and one of the most populated cities in Spain. While providing more opportunities for Torres, it would have also been an important and stimulating location for a curious craftsman wanting to hone skills in the luthiery department. Seville was a town that was made rich from the New World exhibitions. It was also a hub of culture. There would have been a plethora of poets, artists, artisans, musicians, luthiers, and more importantly, wood merchants active in the city. Torres likely also shared a shop with other makers such as Manuel Gutierrez and or Soto y Solares. It would be the atmosphere of collective innovation mainly in Seville that would propel Torres's work to the next level. We are not certain exactly when and where he constructed his first guitar. When trying to discover the works of Antonio de Torres, there are some issues. One great source is from Luthier José Romanillos himself, who authored an invaluable book entitled Antonio de Torres' Guitar Maker, His Life and Works. It also should be noted that there had been a few attempts of counterfeiting Torres' guitars. One example is from a famous Barcelona maker, Enrique Garcia, whom himself did not counterfeit guitars. 
Guitar shops in France at the turn of the century advertised Torres guitars in limited quantities and took the work of Enrique Garcia himself and swapped labels using a counterfeit Torres label. José Ramírez, founder of the Ramírez dynasty himself, also was known to forge a mock Torres label, but perhaps for the purpose to prove that the work was his. Players often boasted of the Torres mystique to try a Torres guitar in the shop of Ramírez to then praise the instrument. Ramírez would then take the guitar and remove the label, showing them it was in fact his guitar. This was done to prove a point that he was as capable or more than the great master which preceded him. Antonio de Torres' earliest known surviving work was made in the year 1852. This instrument demonstrated some features of that style. Here, he fashions the scroll-shaped headstock and proportions of the body, all of which are characteristics of the Granada school. Clearly, this instrument doesn't represent the maturity that would come in Torres's later years, but still shows remarkable aptitude and promise in his craftsmanship. A noteworthy guitar of Torres is known as La Leona, or the Lioness, FE04, is a very important work. He uses Spanish cypress for the sides and back. The guitar also features the fan bracing, which he will remain loyal to throughout his life. Torres installs a tournevoz in this instrument. Tournevoz might be the one thing that Torres actually invented. Tournevoz, literally meaning turn voice, is a cone-shaped Helmholtz resonator fixed to the inside rim of the sound hole. The intention behind this part is to enhance the projection of the sound. The bridge lacks a movable saddle on this particular instrument. However, here he uses a now standard 650 mm scale length and the body also has modern dimensions. It is known that Torres lent this instrument to Mastro guitarist Julian Arcas, but never sold it to anyone and remained in his possession until his death. After his death, there were various inquiries for this instrument. However, it was not known to his daughter as La Leona, and in fact, she hadn't known any guitar by this name. The name they were familiar with in regards to this guitar was La Fea, or the ugly. This might be due to the fact that it was relatively plain in regards to ornamentations. The Duke of Montpensier, who resided in the Palace of San Telmo in Seville, was an important patron to the arts, particularly in music, holding many concerts in the city. In the year 1858, there was an exhibition in Seville hosted by the Royal Duke. In this competition, Torres was awarded a bronze medal for his efforts in a particularly ornate guitar known as FE08, or by name given by some notable players at the time as La Guitarra Cumbre, or the Supreme Guitar. The outcome of this competition would have also likely solidified his place as a guitar maker and offered a prestige status as this afforded him the title Don before his first name. The guitar had a considerable amount of intricate marquetry of the meander pattern and herringbone running through the back, sides and headstock of the instrument, showing his level of mastery and skill. It also featured bird's eye maple, or ojo de pájaro, a tournevoz, and modern dimensions. The 1859 FE09 guitar is important due to the fact that it belonged to prestigious guitarist Miguel Yobet. More simple in design, not having any special inlays and having imported Brazilian rosewood back and sides, it also featured a tournevoz. Another feature on this guitar worth mentioning is the fact that the outer two fan braces pass under an opening carved from the lower harmonic bar, extending further into the soundboard, perhaps a true experimental innovation by Torres himself. Miguel Yobet used this instrument extensively through his career and more interestingly even recorded with it. German luthier Hermann Hauser seems to have used the rosette on this guitar in many of his works. The paper mache guitar 1862 FE14 is a fascinating study into the acoustic aspect of the guitar as well as the function of the soundboard. Torres built this guitar with paper mache sides and back, while the soundboard being of his standard seven fan brace design. The purpose of this was to demonstrate how important the soundboard is for acoustic output, 
and how cheap or inferior materials for the back and sides play less of a role acoustically. Having been repaired multiple times due to the soft nature of the paper mache, the guitar today is not in a playable state, but resides in the Museum of Barcelona. In 1868, Torres would wed his second wife, Josefa Martin, at the El Salvador church close to his home. Maestro guitarist Julian Arcas was his best man at the wedding. To Josefa, his first son, Teodoro, Isabel and Antonio, his second son, were born out of wedlock. In 1872, another daughter, Matilda, would be born, and in 1876, his youngest daughter, Anna, would be born to Josefa. Arguably, one of the most important moments in Torre's career would be that related to Francisco Tarrega's first visit to his shop in 1868. This could also be marked as one of the most important things to happen to Spanish guitar music. Already an incredible talent, the relatively unknown Tarrega was just 17 when he travelled from Barcelona to Torre's shop in Seville looking for a worthy guitar to suit his growing abilities. Ironically, the first guitar handed to Tarrega was not a particularly worthy one, because shortly upon hearing Tarrega play, Torres stops him and hands him a more significant instrument. This would be a 1864 instrument known as FE-17, which was Torres' personal guitar. Tarrega would play this instrument for 20 years and would shape the music he wrote, and even how he played the guitar. Tarrega, being a habitual chain smoker, left his mark in the form of cigarette burns on the sides of the guitar after many years of use. Guitarist Emilio Pujol regarded this instrument as the greatest sound he heard, the basses and trebles matching. Even virtuoso Miguel Yobe remarked that his and Tarrega's guitar are the best sounds available, but he preferred Tarrega's guitar over his own. The late 1860s was a particularly challenging time for Spain, an agricultural crisis as well as a war for Cuban independence in 1868, followed by a revolution in the same year ensured a depression for the economy. It might be for these reasons that compelled Torres to leave Seville for Almeria in 1869. It's likely that due to the inability to produce sufficient income from the guitar-making business in this climate led to the Torres family, to establish a more stable income via a retail china business with his wife. He does, however, continue to make some guitars in this period. However, after 15 years of marriage, Josefa's life is tragically claimed by cancer. The loss of his wife was not a defeat for Torres. In fact, this event strangely led to Torres nearly doubling his output of guitars per year from roughly 6 to 12. It seems that in the flamenco guitar world, Torres might have also sparked the development of the art form for having made more affordable guitars for gypsies or for those who couldn't afford his more superior work. These guitars were made from locally sourced wood, such as Spanish cypress sides, and back often with knots, sometimes unmatching pieces of spruce. Five internal fan bracings instead of seven. Cedar neck. Traditional style friction pegs for tuning instead of tuning machines which were more expensive. This style of guitar is now known as flamenca blanca, or white flamenco, due to the light colour of the cypress sides and back compared to rosewood or mahogany. Although Torres did produce many guitars in this fashion, one such instrument was made in 1889, known as SE-126. An important business trip to Barcelona, 1884 to 1885, was one of networking and promotion. This trip did in fact yield to him some new orders from Catalan guitarists. Tarrega and Jobet were in fact Catalan artists. And by this time, Torres would have had a name there as a prestigious Andalusian guitar maker, perhaps more capable than makers in the north at that time. Here in Barcelona, Torres did construct some instruments having stayed within the house of Federico Cano, a friend and guitarist, 
whose son was a pupil of Dionisio Aguado. Torres might have been deterred from returning to Almeria for some time due to an outbreak of cholera in Almeria and other areas nearby in Andalusia. It is here Torres might have constructed a guitar with eleven strings, to which he made about four that we are aware of throughout his career. Known as SE 83 from 1885, this guitar has seven fan bracings, including two diagonal braces. The first seven strings are frettable, and the remaining four strings overhang the fretboard, much like that of Baroque lutes with particular configurations and definitely like that of Theorbos. Facing his twilight years and decay, Torres befriended a local priest around 1887. Juan Martinez Cervent was someone whom Torres would utilize to help fulfill guitar orders, for in this period he lost much of the steadiness in his hands necessary to carry out delicate work. Sadly, it came to a point where he wasn't even able to sign his own signature. It is little known what kind of woodworking background this priest had, but it must have been sufficient to help Torres carry out the precision work needed to assemble a guitar for he still had to provide for at least one or two of his daughters, and of course, himself. It is in 1892, at 75 years of age, that Torres finally succumbs to intestinal catarrh, as stated on his death certificate. His death was lamented in his town. A thoughtful tribute was written on Torres by a local paper. Torres, having more debts than assets, had the remaining guitars of Torres at the end of his second epoch show some discrepancies that are a mystery and remain unexplained possibly due to the fact that he left many instruments unfinished and either the priest Juan Martinez Cervent or someone else completed them. There seems to be issues with many labels either not having the correct location or the correct street or the correct number written in them. Some of the bracing schemes are different from Torres. Although Torres didn't seem to invent much other than the tournevoz and the bracing method of struts passing under the harmonic bar, his understanding of combining all the important design elements of the seven strut fan bracing system, wider and longer body dimensions, 650 mm scale string length, and the movable saddling on the bridge was the winning recipe for his success. And for that, we have our modern classical guitar, and even our modern flamenco guitar. Antonio de Torre's profound influence extended beyond the realm of guitar craftsmanship setting the stage for a transformative era in the classical guitar's journey. His groundbreaking work not only revolutionized the design of the instrument, but also paved the way for subsequent generations of guitarists and composers to navigate the musical landscape of the 20th century and beyond. Notably, Torres's innovative contributions played a crucial role in empowering guitarists like Miguel Llobet and Francisco Tarrega, enabling them to carry the torch of classical guitar artistry into a new century. The enduring legacy of Torres resonates not only in the timeless beauty of his instruments, but also the future generations of guitar makers and players alike. So what is the guitar? What has it become? As a result of the artisans contributing to its development, the guitar became one of the most versatile instruments. For the Spanish and classical guitar, it became a small instrument, capable of mimicking the piano and even orchestras due to polyphonic abilities, sometimes being the preferred version of a piece written for piano. The guitar became a suitable means of expression for Spanish music, classical, country music, jazz, blues, rock and roll, heavy metal and much more. The guitar is a symbol of Western culture. Without it, we lose a large portion of our identity. Without it, we would be a different people.